this time children you are dismissed your teachers will meet you in the back and the choir will will say take the name of Jesus with
pray that song reminds you as you go through this week, the name of Jesus, take it wherever, with you wherever you go. There's so much power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing one more. So will I. Pay attention to the words in this song. It's a lot of worship, a lot of truth, a lot of things to consider and think about. So will I. salvation 
of my failures and of pride. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part decides Gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart in a million different ways. Every precious what a child you died to sing. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to God's Word. Standing up here, it's a little different. Uh, there's not as many folks or smiling faces out there this morning, but we're glad you're able to make it here for our time of worship and Bible study. Um, I've got two things I want to share with you. Uh, one is uh, tonight at 5 o'clock, even though I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, uh, I'm not sure that God will be watching the Super Bowl but I hope that you will make plans to be here tonight at 5. I promise I will let you out in time for you to get back home for the opening kickoff. And uh, I know that uh, some of you uh, look forward to this date because a lot of people do across America and around the world. And football used to be a really big part of my life, but I'm, I'm past that now. It's not that big a deal anymore. Uh, as... Uh, Stephen said, it's, my team's not playing, uh, so, uh, and when Appalachian starts playing in the Super Bowl, you'll know that uh, it's time for the Lord to come back. But anyway, uh, I know that also that uh, uh, Eric at the end, Eric, you want to go ahead and do that now? You want to make your announcement? You want to? You want to wait till the end? Either way. All right, you're up, so come on, we'll let you do it right now. Uh, Eric has an announcement he wants to make from the pastor search committee. And while he's doing that, let me just remind you, tonight we'll be looking still at uh, some of the most fascinating things of the Word of God in the Old Testament, especially the book of Leviticus, and I hope you'll make plans to be here at 5 o'clock. Eric? Yeah, just real brief, guys. Um, the pastor search committee has put out the survey. You've probably seen it on your email and maybe seen it in the Welcome Center. Um, we do ask for you to fill that out and turn it in today if you haven't been able to do that. Um, we just want to kind of all be in one accord as we're going through this process, and uh, this helps us to do that. And uh, we're also wanting to commit to you guys to, after the service, the first Sunday of each month, we'll 
come and communicate any updates that we may have um, from the committee. So just wanted to share that with you guys this morning, okay? Thank you. I put him on the spot. He, I didn't tell him I was going to do it before. Uh, uh, so, uh, but we're uh, glad that God is still in control and God's still working for uh, looking for the pastor. And uh, actually, God's not looking. Our, our search committee's trying to find the mind of God and, and seek the right person that God has already decided should be here. And so uh, we'll be uh, keeping them in our prayers, or I hope you will. Uh, in fact, one of my, uh, my friends, uh, their church, uh, local church, but they're going through a pastor search also. And uh, he said that he's got on his refrigerator, um, he's got all the names of those that are on the pastor search committee, and he's praying for them. So uh, I don't know if you've got them. They're all in your bulletin if you want to list those five names of those five uh, um, men and ladies that are in, in, I guess, to find that right person, just praying that they'll seek the mind of God. All right, uh, let me get started this morning. Before I really get into the message, for those of you that have been here, I know that uh, you probably already recognize that I'm going to spend a few minutes before I actually get to the text explaining sort of a lead-in to the text because it's important. I don't necessarily preach, I can but I don't necessarily just grab a text out of the scripture. I like to figure out or at least explain it as best I can, where it fits in the scripture and why it's important. And so I'm going to ask a question. And I have a prize here. I have a little gift for anybody that can answer the question. From last week's sermon, there was one word that stood out that is very important. It's the Hebrew word. Does anybody remember that word? Shema or Shema, okay? And I saw some hands go up, so they're still in the mode. Who said that first back here? Miss Judy, you said that? Did you say that? All right. I'll walk all the way down here. Y'all missed out. There you go. It's a million dollar bill. It is. It's a real million dollar bill. Is as good as the paper it's printed on. All right, Shema, the great Shema. I did not preach that message just so I fill up a, a 45 minute sermon or whatever. It has to do with our relationship with God and is extremely important. I was watching an old, old movie this week and um, it was uh, the guy in there actually quoted the Shema, it was uh, a Western. But uh, he quoted the Shema in that, and I thought, wow, that's neat. Uh, here it is 50 or 60 years ago, maybe even 70 or 80 years ago when this movie was made. And so they quoted the Shema, but it's something that still passed down from the last 3,500 years, so it's very important. Now, for half of Miss Judy's um, million-dollar bill, can anybody quote the Shema? Here... Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. Thou shalt, tell me the rest of it, thou shalt love. All right, come on. I know y'all are having a Joe Biden moment up here, but uh, please uh, help me out. The Lord thy God is one. Hear, O Israel, thou shalt love him with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy Mind or strength, either one of those are acceptable. Jesus quoted it in the New Testament, it's translated one way, but in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it's translated the other. Thus, the reason I bring that up is, I don't want you to forget what I taught last week, because I'm building, just like in mathematics, if you taught mathematics, or if you had a math class when you were young, you had to learn in graduate levels to reach the very top. And so I teach the Word of God so that you might build upon what you learned before and apply it. That's why, I'll be honest with you, those that are coming Sunday nights, you're getting an extra dose so you'll have a jump start when the rapture takes place. You'll beat the rest of them out of the ground because you already know what's taking place and you need that extra time. And so uh, if you will come on 5 o'clock Sunday nights, I promise you, I will tell you something you've never heard before. And I know that you'll be amazed. 
maybe. <laughs> no guarantees on that. Here behind me or behind you or you can see in front of you a world map. The map mainly if you want to look at the uh, uh, European, Asian, and African continents, you will see that right in the middle, right where those continents join, there you can't see it from that map, but it's so small, there is a little tiny nation or a little tiny land strip that God says, I'm going to do something very special with this very little spot. It's the point where all of those from uh, Europe, all of those in the European nations, they, to get to Africa, before ships, they had to cross that land mass. All of those from Asia had to come down in that same little area and that fertile crescent and cross over by the way of the sea or the, uh, 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 the way of the, uh, the King's Highway to get to the trade routes. And commerce became very important. For the last 4,000 years from the time of Abraham, there were caravans that were traveling through this little section of land about the same size as New Jersey. God placed it there because all of the other kingdoms of the world, all of those other nations had false gods that they were worshiping. They were worshiping, and I'm just going to name a few, uh, uh, Mithra, um, uh, in, down in Egypt, they worshiped Ra and uh, uh, Astera and um, Horus and some of those other gods. To the north, they were worshiping uh, Baal or Baal and, and uh, Astra and just a, a variety of multiple gods. All of those are gods, yes, but they're little g's because they are not the creator of the universe. They are created beings, but God, after the flood, he allowed them to live, or at least some of them, and many people accepted them and made them their gods. And so what took place is God says, I'm not going to take any of these other nations. These, the Assyrians, uh, they worship Dagon, it's mentioned in the scriptures. The Babylonians, uh, they worship Nimrod, and they also worship uh, uh, Mithra. Uh, and Tammuz is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. So all of these other large kingdoms, they had gods. God says, I'm going to take a man that's too old to have a child and a wife that's too old to have a child. I'm going to give them a child, and from their descendant, I'm going to give my nation my people, I'm going to call them by not my name, and they shall be my people. And I'm going to show the rest of these false gods how great I am by making a nation from them. A nation that will stand for all of eternity. And so God chose this little piece of property here. It's in the center of this great area that every civilization had to cross to be able to get to. In fact, that's why the nation of Israel is so important today. Because even though we have commercial lines that uh, go by sea, that little landmass has been the place of struggle for many centuries. And still today, there are groups of people, even here in America, that are protesting, and they're protesting for Hamas, wanting a ceasefire, wanting all the things to go uh, against Israel. In fact, their motto is, from the river, which is the Tigris Euphrates River, Delta to the sea, to the Mediterranean. They want every Jew wiped out because that's God's people. It is not something that humans would normally do, but it's something that all of these false gods demand that their people do. You see, this nation, as well as any other nation that has a false god, they are controlled, Now I know this may sound a little strange, they are controlled by demonic forces. Now some people say, Pastor, you're getting a little strange. You're getting falling off the deep end. We live in a modern society. We live in a modern age where there are no demonic forces. There's no such thing as the real devil. Well, Satan just won half the battle, maybe three-fourths of the battle. When he can convince you that there's no such thing as evil out there or evil forces, then he has won that battle. Because you and I as Christians, if you are a born-again child of God, which I assume that most of you claim to be, if you are a born-again child of God, the Bible clearly says that we are at war. There is a spiritual war going on not only in our brains but in the world around us. And you and I as Christians must be prepared for that. 
Most churches don't have a clue. Most churches come to service 9, 30, 10 o'clock, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, whatever. They sit down, they sing a few songs, they hear a, a preacher preach a song or preach a message or whatever, and they've got it all, they'll leave, and never any change in their life whatsoever. But I want you to realize that if there is a spiritual battle, and you and I have been called as part of the angels or part of the host of heaven. The angels are the main host. But we are called the army of God and you and I are to do battle. And we've got to be prepared. So just as any other trainer or teacher is preparing that young student or that adult student to be prepared to face the things of the world, the pastor the man of God must be preparing the flocks and those that are called Christians to do battle. Most people do not even recognize that. You need to recognize that today. I hope you do. If not, you need to be here tonight at 5 o'clock and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Now, if you have your Bibles, well, no, no, before I tell you to turn, that little strip of land called the nation of Israel today well, it was the very first recorded battle in history. It was recorded between Egypt and between Assyria. They were battling over because Assyria was up here. I'm going Assyria from looking at your map. Assyria is uh, in Lebanon and Iran in that little gray section there, and Egypt, of course, is in the northern. Uh, eastern side of Africa. The very first battle that's recorded in all of history was between Assyria and Egypt. The last battle that's also recorded in all of history, the Battle of Armageddon, will be fought in that very same field outside of a little hill called Megiddo. It's in the valley of Jezreel. Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo, R is the pronunciation, R, Megiddo, Armageddon is what we know it as. And this is where that final battle will be fought. And so the forces of evil are going to stand against the forces of good, of course, forces of God. And so that little place that we know as Israel is still being fought over today. Now, it was fought over throughout history. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of background, but I want you to know from the time frame of what we're talking about, especially if you know the book of Daniel. Daniel was in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was king. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He had a giant man, a head of gold, a, a arms of silver, a bronze, and then finally iron legs. Daniel interpreted those dreams as the greatest kingdoms that were to come. He said that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. He says, but after you will come a, another kingdom of silver, of the arms here, got the two arms. We didn't know exactly what it was, but later on it's explained it's the Medes and the Persians. And then after the Persians were the brass, that is the Greek kingdom, the Greek empire. We know one of those characters, you, hopefully you might remember one, Alexander the Great. The, he was uh, only 32 years old when he uh, started winning all of his battles. Actually, he died when he was 32. But he is the Greek Empire. It was for 200 years it existed. But after the fall of the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire became the supreme kingdom of the world. For 600 years or so, it ruled about 200 B.C. to about 400 A.D., the Roman Empire was the great empire of the world. Daniel saw all that in the vision that God revealed to him. Now, as I've already mentioned, there was a battle taking place. And so one of the battles, when the Greeks came into power, they, for a short period of time, they controlled Israel. If you want to call it Palestine, you can. People want to use that word. That word is not used. It's named after the Philistines. But if you want to say Israel, for a while the Greeks controlled Israel. They were under tremendous bondage. 
The last of the Greek empires, or the last of the Greek kings, was a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Antigonus Epiphanes, the fourth. And here's what he did. He said, these Jews are so pesty, and they're, they're terrible. I've got to get rid of the Jews. So he says, they keep doing things to their gods, but I want them to worship the gods of the Greeks. I want them to become Greeks and worship just like me, and that way I can keep control of them. So he said, you can no longer use circumcision. No, none of the little male boys could be circumcised. He says, you can't celebrate any of those feasts, like Passover, etc. And he says, you've got to get rid of all of the things that have to do with praying the great Shema. He wanted to convert them. Well, it just so happens that a group of believers, Jewish believers, that believed in God, they lived in and around the southern part of Israel. They lived about four or five miles south of Jerusalem. They lived in a little town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem was at that point a major or a big city. This is about 200 B.C. Antiochus, he, uh, the fourth, he is controlling. And so these men and families that were located in and around the Judean mountains around Bethlehem, they said, we're going to keep doing these things. And so they said, we're going to move. We're going to leave Bethlehem and we're going to find us a spot that we can celebrate all the feasts that just as God says, we can do all of we can do Passover, uh, we can do circumcision, we can do all of these things just as the word of God commands us. So they moved about 80 miles north to an area where there were only a few people, mostly nomadics that were living in tents. And they built a new village. And that new village was named Nazareth. Now, if you'll have your, take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to honor the reading of God's Word as we stand together and read the first five verses of chapter 11 of Isaiah. I'm reading from the New King James. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity uh, uh, for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these words coined 26 centuries ago by the prophet Isaiah, they're not usually read or studied, but they're so important to us. And so, Father, as we Look at these words today. We pray that you will speak to our hearts. That spirit that fell upon this one that they're talking about, the spirit of the Lord fell upon him, that that same spirit will dwell on us and in us, that we might not only understand, but we might be able to grow to be more like Jesus Christ. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. There is a word 
that is used in the scriptures. Uh, what, l- let me just l- let me have you turn to your Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter two, and I want to look at verse twenty-three just for a moment. Matthew chapter two, verse twenty-three. Here is a verse at the end of Matthew's nativity story. He's talking about the little boy Jesus has been visited by, there in chapter 2, has been visited by the wise men. And he says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophets, that he shall be called a Nazarene. And the question is, what prophets? You see, the problem is, Nazareth was not a city in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned anywhere. So why did, the, why did Matthew say that the prophets mentioned that Jesus was going to be a Nazarene from Nazareth? Why, why in the world a Nazarene is a person from Nazareth? Well, you and I are Americans from America, or from the United States. So we're Americans... A Nazarene is from Nazareth. But it's it's not prophesied in the Old Testament because it's using the word Nazareth, but it's used, and Matthew says, as it was prophesied that it might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Why in the world would Matthew say that? And it's not in the Bible. It's not in the English Bible because it is in the Hebrew Bible. The word Nazarene, here's how it came from. The word, I'm going to use the word Netzer. Uh, The word Netzer, N-E-T-Z-E-R, has to do with something that happens to an olive tree. An olive tree that is planted over here has roots that go out. An olive tree will last. In fact, they claim, I don't know this for a fact, but at least they claim that if you go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was the last few days of his life, he spent a praying uh, there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was taken captive, that those olive trees, some of them are 2,000 years old. Some of them may have been just a little small uh, bush at that time, at the time of Christ. I don't know, but that's what they say. But those olive trees are extremely old. But here's how an olive tree multiplies. It will shoot forth its roots out under the ground. In some cases, you may have some roots that may go out as far as 60 or 80 feet. And then all of a sudden, a little sprout or a little stem or a little rod or what the Hebrews would call a netzer would shoot out. And it would start, it would leaf out and have green to it. And so that little netzer would begin to grow. And if allowed, without somebody cutting it down or stomping on it or whatever, allowed to grow, that little netzer would grow into an olive tree. In the same sense that when Jesus' family back in 160, 170 B.C., 170-something years before Jesus Christ was born, his descendants, or excuse me, his ancestors, the family of Jesse... If you remember your Old Testament, Jesse had a son, uh, uh, or had a son named David, King David. Bethlehem is known as the town of David, or the city of David. There's actually two cities of David, but this city of David is called Bethlehem because that's where David grew up. He was from Bethlehem. His father Jesse was. All of the kings were a part of this tribe called Judah. And so you had to be descended of David to have a rightful heir to the throne or be a rightful heir to the throne of David. You had to be one of his descendants. And so these people from Bethlehem in 170 B.C. at the time that Antiochus, uh, uh, Antiochus or Antiochus, that he said, I'm, I'm going to stop all your worship of Jewish practices. They said, we're leaving And so they moved to another location about 80 miles north. There was not a whole lot of people around. And because they were of the root of Jesse, they said, we're going to name our town 
the town of Netzer, a little sprout or a little root or stem rod that comes up. We are Netzer, and so they named their town Nazareth. That's where the name came from. It only happened about 170 or 180 years before Christ. But the prophets knew that. They didn't know what they were prophesying, but God did. And so he told Isaiah, and it's mentioned, actually it's mentioned in several places throughout the scriptures. There are several prophets that mention this, but Isaiah is the most prominent one. Here in chapter 10, he says, uh, chapter 11 rather, he says, There shall come forth a rod or a stem of Jesse and a branch, that word branch, if you'll notice, in my Bible, it's capitalized. Raise your hand if that word is capitalized in your Bible. Okay, most of you. That is a, a commentary or a translator's prerogative. It means that it has something to do with the Messiah. And so they give you a little clue there. In the Hebrew, there's no such thing as capitalization. But they give us a clue there. It says, and a branch shall grow. That word branch is the word netzer. A branch shall grow of his roots. If you remember when Christ was first on the scene, he was baptized of John, John the Baptist. John and Andrew came running back. They went up to the Galilee section. And they said, hey, um, they found Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was sitting under a tree. They said, we have found the Messiah. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Nazareth, there's no prophet supposed to come out. The Messiah is not coming from Nazareth. Later on, when Jesus was standing before the Pharisees and they were questioning him, they said, hey, you can't be the Messiah because you're from Nazareth. No prophet. No prophet comes from Nazareth. No prophet comes from this area up in here. See, they didn't know that Jesus had actually been born in Bethlehem, but he was a netzer. He was the stem. He was the root. He was the branch of his ancestor, Jesse. It says that and explains that in Matthew chapter 1 where it gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the perfect netzer. He is the perfect shoot of his father or ancestor Jesse, but he was also prophesied by the book of Isaiah or by the prophet Isaiah 600 years before Jesus was even born. God knew all of the things that would take place to bring him up. Now I'm going to ask you, remembering that word netzer is very important because it builds on what we're going to talk about later on, but we're going to look at these verses today. Now it's not just for the Jews. The Gentiles, now unless you're a Jew, the Bible classifies there's two classifications. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. The Jews have been prophesied this Messiah. But God does not leave us out as a Gentile. He's also said the Gentiles also will receive the great blessings. Look back here at Isaiah chapter 11 again. Look at verse 10. He says, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to his people for the Gentiles shall seek him, that's us, and his resting place shall be glorious. That means the final home of God will be glorious. The final place that Jesus will set up will be wonderful, but it will not be just for the Jews. It will also be for us as Gentiles. And so these are important for us because these words tell us not only how the Jew looked for that. Now, something's interesting. They did not know if Jesus, or the, excuse me, uh, let me give you another definition of a word. I've told you before, but I will remind you. The word Christ, the word Christ is an English word. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word. They mean exactly the same. They're translated one to the other. So it means anointed of God or anointed one. So in the Old Testament when it mentions the anointed of God or the one that would come, 
It's understood this is the Messiah they're talking about. In the New Testament, we say Jesus Christ, or Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed One. When um, uh, Peter was asked there in uh, Caesarea Philippi, they asked him, who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some think you're John the Baptist. He'd already been beheaded before then. Some say you're Elijah, the prophet. That had been predicted to come before the Messiah. And Jesus asked them point blank, but who do you say that I am? Does anybody know what, he, what Peter said? Thou, what is it? Come on, bite. I'm at, come on. Thou art what? Thou art the Christ. Y'all know it. Just speak it out. Shout it out. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Help me out now. Say it again. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Peter may not have said Christ. That's English. He said, Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They knew who he was, even though they denied him later on. They thought they didn't understand he was coming back a second time as King of kings and Lord of lords. They thought he was coming up to set an earthly kingdom. But Isaiah actually says he's coming back again the second time. Notice what we just read there. Look at verse 12, uh, verse 11. He, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again, again the second time. See, Christ, the Bible even says that he's coming back again, but they still didn't fully understand it. They didn't know that Jesus was a man. They thought he was God in the flesh. Some people people recognized him as a great prophet, which he was. Some people understood him to be God, which he was. Some people understood him to be just a man, as he was. See, Jesus fulfilled. And let me explain that, too. Some people say he can't be God and he can't be man. Why not? He was, one, he was not 50% God and not 50% man. He was 100% God and 100% man. I'm gonna ha- I heard that. I'm going to have a little practice session. Everybody say amen. All right. If somebody, if whoever's preaching, if they say he was 100% God, he was 100% man, what are you to respond? Say it louder. Amen. You ought to say that. Even you say, I don't care if nobody else says it. I'm going to say it because I want you to know where I stand from. And that preacher, when he hears that, he knows that the congregation that he's preaching to, he knows that they know who Jesus Christ is. A lot of people in Baptist churches still do not have a full concept of who Jesus is. He was 100% God and 100% man. You say, that's impossible. No, it's not. The laws of logic come into play. I'm not saying he's 100% God. The opposite of that would be he's 100% not God. But God and man, God and human being, are two different things. I am 100% the son of Robert and Jackie Bird. I am 100% the father of Jonathan and Jennifer Bird. I am 100% the, uh, the husband of Annette Bird. I can fulfill as long as they don't contradict He is 100% God, 100% man. They did not fully understand that. And they didn't understand that he was going to die. But he had his plan from the very beginning, as we talked about on Sunday night, the very place where Abraham offered his son Isaac. 2,000 years after Abraham, there was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, taking his only son and crucifying him on the altar There to forgive the people of the world of their sins as we just sang about it. All the billions of failures, all the billions of sins that have been committed. Jesus Christ bore those to the cross of Calvary for our sins. He took our sins and paid the debt once and for all. Jesus Christ is coming back again. Jesus said that in... Thank you. Uh, We might need to practice that again. Everybody say amen. Come on, say it again. Again. A little louder. All right. Everybody wants a free lunch. Say amen. All right. I'm inviting you out to lunch. I'll take care of the tab today. All you got to do is just give a donation. The bigger, the better, right? I talked to Zach uh, before. Zach is here, uh, but he's in the kitchen stirring soup. So uh, he he said he might make it out here, but... uh, I hope you'll stay for lunch. In fact, my wife and I, we're, go- we're staying. 
my wife wants to take your picture. And you say, I don't want my picture made. It's just for our benefit. All we're going to do is post it on the board or on a piece of paper in a notebook so that I can remember and she can remember your names. Because I tell you, it's a struggle. You're only meeting one of me and one of Annette. But there's a whole bunch of you. And some of you look alike. Uh, Y'all favor each other. And I see you. And sometimes I don't know husbands and wives. I need to put those together and families and kids. Uh, so please, if you don't have your picture made today, uh, she'll eventually hit you up for a picture. Because not only will we use it, but the last church we were in, we made a notebook and, and we put all the connections in there and gave you all that information. And when the new pastor came in, we handed him the notebook. And so he was able to look at it and study the pictures. Uh, I know there's directories out there, but some of you have changed a little bit in the last directories. Now, let's see. What was I preaching on? I forgot. Oh, amen. You need to amen that new pastor when he comes in. Uh, whenever it may be, you need to learn how to say, I agree. The word amen, uh, uh, amen, or amen, is the word, I, I know I'm preaching a little later, but lunch is over here, so you don't have to go too far. I heard one of the craziest things. Some preacher stood up in the Senate chamber, the United States Senate chamber, and offered a prayer at the beginning of this particular Congress year or whatever. And he said, he ended the prayer, Amen and Amen. That shows the pure ignorance. Amen has nothing to do with a man or a woman. Amen, or a, the word Amen is Amen, which means truly. It means this is, I agree, this is honest, this is the real thing. This is what truth is. Amen. When you say amen, you're saying, that's what truth, that is truth. There is no question, if you are a born-again child of God, when you say amen, you're testifying, I believe that he's 100% God, that he's 100% man, he died on the cross, he arose from the grave, he paid for my sin, and one day he's coming back for me, and I'm going with him to heaven. Amen. Very good. All right, we got it now. I've got some more million-dollar bills out in the car. I'll have to go get them and pass them out to you. Anyway, actually, I have a $50 trillion bill. It's a real bill used by a government. You sure? $50 trillion. You say, there's no such thing. Yes, there is. I have. It's a legitimate money. Here it is. Issued from the Bank of Zimbabwe. Fifty trillion dollars. What can you buy with that? Might be able to buy a loaf of bread with it. Fifty trillion. One day that money in your pocket is going to be worth about the same as this dollar here. Because when we go to a um, central bank digital currency, they're going to change it all. And when the world comes to a, a screeching halt as the Bible. Now, I don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime or not. I, I'm not making any predictions. It could. I just don't know. But this paper right here might be worth blowing your nose on. That's probably uh, about all it's worth. And the money in your bank, if you have put your faith in that money, it's worthless. Now, I'm going to close up with this. Look back at Isaiah chapter 11. Close my Bible, so I got to find it again. Isaiah chapter 11, here's what it says again. It says, There shall come forth a rod, a netzer, from the netzer of Jesse, stem of Jesse, and a branch, a netzer, shall grow out of his roots. And here's what it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, Jesus was 100% God, there is no question. But while he was here on this earth in Philippians chapter 2, it says that he did not utilize, he did not perform the miracles that you see through his divine power. He, gave, he, laid those, he didn't lay them aside, he still held on. He was fully God here on this earth. But he did not use his power. 
when he was baptized, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of the dove. And so it says right here, the Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit Is your spirit in your Bible, is it capitalized? That signifying, hey, they're, they're trying to tell you, this is, this is the Spirit of God, this is the Holy Spirit, we call him in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now listen to this carefully. The same Spirit that dwelt on Jesus Christ, that gave Him the power to perform the miracles. And you can go through the whole book, the first 20 chapters of Isaiah, and you'll see a whole lot more about what Jesus, the Messiah, was going to do. And Jesus did it. But here is what Jesus did. He took the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Him. And that same Spirit, if you're born again, dwells in you. So just as Jesus had... The Spirit of the Lord rests upon him. The Spirit of the Lord should be dwelling in you. And the Spirit of wisdom. How much wisdom do we need in our world today? If you're going to survive, if you're going to know how to prepare you and your family for the next things that's going to happen in this world, the only way you can do that is through wisdom. You can get all the factual knowledge. You can read as much of the Internet as you want to. But the only place you're going to get true wisdom is from this book right here. I'm very good. Amen. Somebody's catching on. Miss Judy, you're going to be owing him a million dollars. It says there, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel. The spirit of counsel, if, you, if you're trying to make a decision and you want to say, you know, I need to talk to some people that maybe have done this before. And you go and speak to somebody, maybe this Maybe think about switching jobs or, or whatever it may be. Talk to somebody that's done that and see, okay, try to weigh out your, your pros and cons, so to speak. But if you want to have the counsel of God, this is where you got to go. You allow the Holy Spirit to take His words right here and to teach you what is your direction in life. And I've told you the goal in life, and I'm going to ask you this again. Does anybody remember what I said about three weeks ago, what the goal of your life is? No, you don't. Okay, I'll pre repeat it. To please God. Anybody remember? To become like Him, like Jesus. We want to please God by becoming like His Son. That's our goal in life. That's why you were created, that you might please God... And glorify Him by becoming like His Son, Jesus Christ. Not the physical, you know, sandals and uh, long hair, beard and robe, as it says up there on the picture. An actual picture of uh, Jesus' Facebook page is right back here. But um, that's not what... He's talking about the inside of us. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's how we get the counsel of God. And might... Might, there it does not mean physical strength. Might means standing when all of those around you have stepped back. You know the old sign, uh, you got a military guys up here and say, okay, who volunteers to do, go on this mission? They're hoping somebody will step forward. But then that's not what happens. Everybody else steps back and you're left standing there all by yourself. You want to demonstrate your might? When everybody else steps back, then you'll say, I'm going to stand on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stand on His Word. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we don't know if God can, will save us, but we know He can. But whether He does or not, does not matter. We will not bow before this fire, before this uh, uh, idol. You and I are one day possibly going to have to make that stand. Can your children make that stand? Yes. If they've seen daddy and mama make that stand, the children can make that stand. If they've seen their grandparents make that stand, they can make their stand for Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know about that. Uh, we just don't have a lot of people willing to go the extra mile for the Lord Jesus Christ these days. That's because we as parents haven't stood where God wanted us to stand in His might. Knows what else the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Fear, 
in the most of the cases in the Old Testament, fear is not being afraid of God, you know, hitting you upside the head. Fear has to do with the reverence. A better word there would be reverence. When I was teaching school, the kids, a few kids every now and then would have me sign their annual. And I would find my picture there and I'd sign it. And I'd put Proverbs 9, 10. And it says, the fear of the Lord. No, excuse me, Proverbs 10, 9. Excuse me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No matter what you learn in school, you can learn knowledge. You can learn a whole bunch of junk these days. But you have to have this book right here to have the spirit of wisdom. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment more. If God is speaking to you, I hope he has. We realize that there is no hope for this world except through Jesus Christ. He's coming, as it says there in Isaiah, it says he's coming the second time. He's coming again on that day. We're looking for the day of the Lord when he comes back. And we better be ready. Because I can tell you this, I don't know when he's coming back. It may be this year, it may be next year, it may be a thousand years from now. But it sure looks like things are getting close in our world around us. In the days of Noah, there was wickedness abounding everywhere. And Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 24, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. You see, God does not tell us because He wants us to be prepared at any time. If a person told me, and I've had people tell me this, well, I'm going to accept Jesus someday. I'm just not ready right now. And I would tell them. I told them in the hospital laying in the bed, I was standing there beside the bed. I said, okay, here's my phone number. On the day before you die, you call me up and tell me that you're about to die and I'll come back and you can receive Jesus. And they'll say, well, I don't know. I, I don't know when I'm going to die. That's exactly right. None of us know when we're going to breathe our last breath and the next breath we will be in front of the judge receiving our eternal judgment. The only way to know for certain that you can be in the presence of God for eternity is to make a decision now. Don't wait. You say, well, I'll wait till next Sunday. I'll wait till next week. We never know when Christ may come back or when He may call us into eternity. You see, that's the, the thrill of living for Jesus. We don't know, but we know someone who does know the future. He knew 600 years before Jesus was born that a town of Nazareth was going to come and be formed a root of the stem of Jesse, a branch. That's so exciting to know that God knew what was going to take place and He knows what's going to happen to your life. Are you ready to turn your life over to Him? If you know, now here's the thing. If you say, well, I'm a Christian, that's great. Maybe there's somebody in your family, maybe there's somebody in your life that you're praying for. If you're not praying for somebody that's lost, God might as well go ahead and take you home now. If you're not praying for somebody, if you're not witnessing to somebody, God, folks, I hate to use this word, but you're worthless as a child of God. If we're not praying for the lost, if we're not praying for those that need to hear Jesus, then we might as well go ahead and be taken on home. If God is speaking to you, whether it's to pray for, pray for others or lifting your life up to God, we invite you to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen.